Cool. Um, welcome to the next session. Um, we have here Bruce Merry, who needs only some introduction. Um, from a PhD at UCT, um, some time working for ARM, um, postdoctorate. Uh, he's now on the Square Kilometer Array Science Data Processing Team. Um, and in his spare time, he thinks that static typing is uh, in C++ is, is a good thing. Oh, that looks better. Is that sounding better? Yep. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's a bit echoey. Okay. Right. So, morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about using asynchronous I/O with GPUs. Uh, so I'll start with just a little bit more about who I am, what I do, what we do in the science data processing team, and GPUs. But it's mostly going to be about asynchronous I/O. So if you've never programmed a GPU before, or don't even know what it stands for, don't worry. You hopefully won't get too lost. And then I'll dive into a particular sort of framework that I've been developing at SK. And the third section is a sort of filler material if I actually managed to get through all 49 slides in less than 45 minutes. I got it went a bit overboard. Okay, so who am I? Um, as David said, I'm a software developer at SKA South Africa. I don't work on the SKA, so if you come and have questions about the SKA, I probably don't actually know. I work on the Meerkat project, which is a precursor to the SKA. So that's a 64-dish array we're building in the Karoo, it's actually going to be incorporated into phase one of the SKA in South Africa. So I kind of am working on the SKA, but software-wise, I'm just working on the Meerkat uh, project. Uh, so there's just a picture of, you know, we've got a bunch of dishes up out in the Karoo. Uh, I don't actually know very much about astronomy at all. I've kind of picked up a little bit as I go along there, but if you ask me astronomy questions, I'm probably going to refer back to the Monty Python Galaxy song. That, that's mostly what I know about astronomy. Uh, so my background, as you probably gathered from David, was computer science. I went into graphics, which is what I was doing at ARM. And from graphics, I got into more general GPU programming. Uh, so why do we use GPUs? Why is uh, Meerkat a hard thing? People have been doing astronomy for hundreds of years. Um, we, there's a lot of data, and every time people build a new radio telescope, they basically build it as big as they can given the computation. That's really actually what's limiting radio astronomy. So we get uh, from the actual dishes, we have digitizers, so you get uh, digital samples of the waveforms hitting the dishes. That comes to about 2.2 terabits a second. Yeah, and this is for a 64 dish array. So you can imagine what it's going to be like when we've got 3,000 of these things for the full SK. Uh, that's actually so high data rate, we don't touch it in the science data processing team. Uh, we have uh, a separate team who program FPGAs to deal with this in kind of hard real time. My colleague Paul over there is one of them. So if you have questions about that, you can ask him. Uh, by the time we have to deal with the data in our science data processing team, it's been reduced a lot by the FPGAs. It's a mere 57 gigabits or so. That's, that's correlated data. There's several other data products we get. so probably quite a bit higher than that, in fact. Uh, yes. Ooh, OK. Okay, and now it's gone back to the screen. Um, display settings, I can push it back to that one. Okay, is that good? Ooh. Okay, let's go back to how that was. I'm going to get there. OK. 
No, nothing's working. <laughs> uh, I think you run away to get a spare cable. <laughs> Uh, the Galaxy song? Yeah, I'm a little rusty. Oh. <laughs> uh, and apparently, talking to real astronomers, the numbers in there are all actually not very accurate. Uh, possibly they were in 1970 or whenever that was filmed, but uh, you shouldn't actually use that to get your detailed astronomical information if you're writing code <laughs> based on it. wasn't working at all. <laughs> oh dear, he's got a screwdriver out. We're in <laughs> trouble. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, I have yet to have anyone come to me and say, yes, I want to solve the problem of randomly selecting a name from a hat in a li live coding problem. Uh, we have some coffee machines to give away, or at least theoretical coffee machines. Um, this is a theoretical problem until it becomes a hard problem, so I don't know, mathematicians or... Yeah. 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 Bruce, are you going to do a live coding, uh, pulling a name out of a hat for us? Uh, well, the problem with live coding is you should ideally be able to see it on the screen, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I if you can sneak it past the audience, you deserve it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right, should I switch back to the output? Uh, have you tried turning if, if it off and on again? If we can do the, the uh, Python obfuscation, pro, uh, you know, like name out of hat thing, then, then I think you deserve it, you know, like... Um, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be doing it later. Well, shall I put it up? Uh, I'm pushing the button, nothing's happening. Yeah, we did actually have a volunteer. Okay, cool, cool. I'm just going to unplug it and plug it in again. It's, it's doing something funny on my side. Should have it now. Hmm. Why should I put this on a flash drive and use your laptop? Uh, okay. This has never happened before, we <coughs> swear. <laughs> never. <laughs> Audience, uh, does anyone know a joke involving pri programming? <laughs> okay, well, I know one. So, a C string walks into a bar <laughs> and says, Hi, I'd like a beer, please. And another C string walks into the bar and also uh, with him and says, Yes, I'd like a beer too, please. <laughs> and the first string says, You'll have to excuse my friend, he isn't null terminated. Okay, we're back. Right, so as I was saying, we have a lot of data which we need to process. 
Um, but it's very structured data. You get bigger arrays of data. So there's not much of this sort of uh, processing that needs to be done on each item of data. So it fits fairly well with NumPy and that sort of thing. So Python actually works reasonably nicely for this. Uh, why do we use GPUs? Well, we're not actually doing graphics with them, but they're these days they high performance parallel processors. And they're used all over the place for just general purpose processing. Okay, so a little bit more about GPUs. I'm going to give you the short, short version. This is not going to be a course about how to program GPUs. So GPU is a separate processor that sits next to your CPU. So all this, this big block here, is there a laser pointer? Does this thing? Switch on the side. Sorry? Switch on the side. On. Yeah, so everything there is the GPU. Uh, it has its own piece of memory there. It's got a PCIe bus normally that connects the two. And it's got a DMA and direct memory access engine, so the GPU can actually suck data out of your host memory that's on your CPU or push data back to it. And the way you program it is you create these things called kernels, which is just a piece of code. It's a single program multiple data model. And you push this code over to the GPU and you say, please run this bit of code on you know, this big chunk of memory I've got. And the key point is that you can do all of this sort of stuff asynchronously. So you can say, go and uh, process this thing on the GPU, and then your CPU can run along and do some other stuff while that's happening. And in fact, you can also have these DMA transfers happening at the same time as your GPU is doing some work. So while the GPU is processing one bit of data, you can start sending it the next bit of data to work on. But, but that means you need to do a bunch of asynchronous programming, which is why I'm talking about async I.O. Okay, uh, I think I skipped the frame. Right, so asynchronous I.O., what is it? Why do we care? Um, so the alternative to asynchronous I.O. for doing concurrency is use threads. And threads have been around forever, and probably most people have seen them. But they're not all, they don't solve all your problems. They create a whole bunch more problems than the ones you solve. Uh, first big problem for people doing networking more is if you have a service where you want 100,000 people connecting to your box and you're trying to do one thread for every connection, that falls over badly. Um, uh, this is even in languages like C++ where you don't have a global interpreter lock and you can actually scale up your threads to run across multiple cores. Uh, we don't have 100,000 connections in our system for networking. We've got maybe sort of four or five connections going on in SDP because you know, we don't have a whole lot of people on the internet trying to connect to us. Our connections are just our internal systems talking to each other. And uh, the real problem with threads is anything can happen at any time in terms of thread switching. So you have to have locks and condition variables and all these complicated things to reason about uh, what's happening to my state. You know, different things can be trying to get to my state at the same time because it's preemptive. And the other thing you tend to find with threads is if you have a threading idea of, okay, I'm going to dedicate this thread to listening to this network connection, and that's all it does, it just sits blocking in a read from this socket, then it actually becomes very difficult to react to external events, and the most common one is actually being asked to stop. That's often the hardest part in threaded code is, uh, how do I shut this thing down? Because it's sitting blocked waiting for the network connection. It's not going to do anything until some data <laughs> arrives from the network, and suddenly it's, you've got to stop it somehow. So that's why th threads can be a bit nasty. Um, the code I inherited for some of our processing of this you know, 57 gigabits or whatever, uh, used some threads and it had race conditions and then I added locks and it was still a bit tricky to reason about. The new code is much cleaner. So what is asynchronous I.O.? It's kind of threading but without threading and the key point is it's non-preemptive. So when you decide that you're ready to sort of give up control of the CPU and wait until something happens, you then yield control and it goes back to a scheduler which is normally inside your process, it's sort of a Python library rather than the kernel doing the scheduling. And that's also what makes it very lightweight is you don't have to do a, a switch into the kernel, which normally costs a lot of time. It's just happening inside your process. 
Um, how this works internally is, uh, depending on your operating system, you'll have different system calls that allow you to say, wake me up when something happens on one of these many uh, network sockets or file handles or when this amount of time passes. Uh, but that's all handled inside these libraries for you. And yeah, so as I mentioned, you uh, only switch context when you do some sort of blocking operation, like I want to wait for the GPU to be finished with something, or I want to sleep for this many seconds, or I want to wait until there's some data on the socket. So there's different styles of doing asynchronous I/O or event-driven programming, it's also called. So the kind of older style is you have callbacks. Uh, I've never actually used Twisted. I just grabbed something from the documentation. That was uh, so the idea is you say, well, I want to do this, but I don't want to actually block until that happens. Just when it once it's done, call this function here. Uh, that gets kind of nasty to program in because you've got to take your logical flow of your code and break it up into, well, I'm going to do this bit, but then I've got a blocking thing, so then I have to have a separate function for what happens after that happens, and then something else is going to block, and I need another function. It gets a little messy to read. So the other way you're starting to see, even in other languages, though it's very easy in Python, is a sort of coroutine style of things. So this looks like a more complicated example, but it's actually just doing a very simple thing. So this is but a code that will um, just five times print the current time and then sleep for a second. Uh, so it uh, just computes uh, what time it wants to f exit this loop. Uh, it will do the actual printing the current time. That's just checking, you know, have we, do we, have we exceeded the end time? Have we done this enough times? And then the magic piece is here, which is yield from. So yield, you'll probably have seen in Python, uh, if you've written a generator, it says sort of return from this function, but remember where I was, and next time I want to restart from where I was. So this will actually exit this loop and you return control back to the scheduler, um, but it uses some new Python 3.4 syntax, which is yield from. You don't really need to know what that does. It's just how things happen in async IO. You, uh, it has other uses for generators. Uh, basically, that says yield from this other function, which is itself asynchronous. So this is an asynchronous sleep function that's part of the library. Okay, so uh, what on earth do GPUs have to do with asynchronous I.O.? Uh, well, we'll see now. So let's say we've got some sort of processing thing which takes some data off the network, uh, transfers it to the GPU, does some processing on it, gets the results back and sends the results back over the network. And this, this we've got several sort of bits of code in our uh, science data processing pipeline that looked like this. Um, so if you have a fully synchronous version, you'll read some data from the network, then you'll send it to the GPU, you'll wait until it's there, you'll process it, you wait until it's finished, you download the results from the GPU, wait for that to finish, send it to the network. You see there's sort of this huge gap here where nothing's actually happening on the network and you're not using it. And that means that to meet your real-time requirements, when you actually do get around to putting some data on the network, you've got to send it very quickly so that you're done by the time you need to start processing the next thing. Uh, the different colors here, I'm just showing sort of two frames of data. So from this correlator, we'll say every half a second, we'll get a big dump of data that we have to process and then send out. And then half a second later, we get another dump. And you kind of have to keep up with that, otherwise you're in trouble. Um, and similarly, the GPU has got all these sort of little bits of dead time there, where particularly when you're doing all the network stuff, the GPU is not doing anything, which means you're not fully utilizing your resources. So we'll see later a diagram of what we'd really like that to look like, where everything sort of is kept busy all the time. But we're going to use a simplified version of this as just for demo code. Uh, this is actually corresponds more or less to a simulator that I've written for simulating this process, where uh, you start with some buffer of memory on your uh, CPU, which is also called the host, which is why it's got an H uh, prefix on there just to keep things straight. And the first step is you fill it with some random data. Uh, it's sort of good random data and that it has the right statistical properties, but it's basically random data. Then you copy it 
to the GPU, and it's got a D there, which stands for device, which is, again, terminology of the GPU tends to be called the device. Um, in this case, we're just going to multiply it by 3, which is not terribly exciting, but simple, uh, into an output buffer on the device, and then we're going to copy it back to the host, and then we'll maybe print out something about that. So this is a synchronous version of this code. Um, I've left out some of the details, uh, you know, the init, the constructor for this process class I've left out. But it's got a main loop where, while true, it sort of does one frame of this thing and then it sleeps for half a second. Um, so here we're setting the random data in the host buffer. We're taking the device buffer, setting the value based on the host. Um, the kernel is the thing that actually does the work on the GPU. So this tells the GPU, please go and process from the input buffer to the output buffer. Um, this is how many items it has in it. That's just some internal tuning for uh, how it should break up the work, because it's a parallel processor. And the CQ here is a command queue, which is you submit things into a queue of work, which is then processed in order. And you can have multiple command queues to have different uh, tasks happening in parallel on the GPU. Then we read some data back out again, and uh, we print out, so I think this is printing out the variance or something, so we can check that you know it's got the right statistical properties. Um, so the way we like to take this next is just handling the GPU asynchronously, which isn't actually going to get into async IO at all. It just means that you tell the GPU, upload this process at and send me the results back without actually waiting for each step individually to complete. And then once you've told it what you want it to do, you then say, OK, tell me when you're done. And that just has the advantage that for each step, you don't have to um, come back through and interrupt the CPU into the kernel, into user space, into uh, through the C library, into Python, into async IO, up into your code, and then all the way back down again to start the next thing going. That can actually slow things down drastically. So I've highlighted and read the bits that change. So uh, these sort of data transfer functions, you can tell it you want to do asynchronously, which means it'll start this copy, but the function will return immediately. And only later will you actually have finished copying the data. And you have to be careful that you don't touch the data while it's being copied. Otherwise, bad things happen. Um, the kernel itself is actually always asynchronous. So the reason we didn't the reason it looked synchronous last time was actually when you ask for the results back, that goes into the same queue, and it has to happen in order, so that synchronized it. And then you can tell the command queue to finish all the work that it's previously had. Okay. Um, so now we're going to start adding async code. So this is where uh, the, the actual Python library starts becoming asynchronous. So there's a couple of things. So there's this decorator you put on that says this thing is now a coroutine, which <coughs> means it's going to yield control at some point, and I want to restart where I left off. And I've also got this thing called run in executor. I um, don't know how many people have used the concurrent futures package, but it has these things called executors, which uh, is uses a thread or multiprocessing to run something sort of asynchronously from you and give you the result back. Now I said we didn't actually want to use threads, so uh, and yet this is actually going to run that finish command on a separate thread and then wake us up again when we're done. Now why would I do that? That's because uh, that's a blocking operation. Uh, the OpenCL, which is a language used for uh, programming the GPU, is wrapped by a Pi OpenCL library. And it provides that function, but it only provides a blocking version. It doesn't provide an asynchronous version. So this run and executor is a way you can sort of tie blocking operations into your asynchronous code, sort of an escape hatch for if people didn't actually do things properly. Ideally, you should only use this if that blocking work uh, drops the global interpreter lock, because otherwise you're not actually going to be able to service any other network requests or anything else while that blocking operation happens. Unfortunately, PyOpenCL does drop the global interpreter lock while it does that. Uh, then the main loop has also got some slight changes. So uh, one of the things with the yield from is you can use it to call an asynchronous function. And sort of everything propagates up and down the stacks nicely. 
And then we've just had to switch the async sleep instead of time.sleep. So now, with this version, what you get is that if you also had, say, Tornado running a network service that uh, remote clients are connecting to, and if it's integrated with this, which I'll possibly show how to do later, then the network service will remain um, interactive or responsive w while all this is going on, even though there's some blocking operations happening here. It won't block the network handling. So what we really want to get to, though, is something that's fully asynchronous, where uh, we can actually overlap things. So you'll notice here I've actually got sort of two frames of data, and they can happen at the same time on the CPU, on the GPU, sorry. And the idea there is that that can happen because transfers are done with a separate bit of hardware on the GPU from the processing, so it can actually be processing one frame while it's transferring the previous one or the next one. And it doesn't actually get shown here, but um, yeah, and also you can see you're sending data on the network at the same time as you're processing stuff. So you can potentially make full use of all your resources in this case. So here's some code that doesn't work. Don't do this. Uh, so what we've changed is we've now created a separate command queue um, for each time we do a process. So each frame of data, we give it its own command queue. And so as I said, each command queue is an in-order queue of work that you send in the GPU. But then the next frame of data will be sending a separate in-order queue of work. So those two queues can overlap. So why doesn't, oh, and the important part is this asyncio.async thing. That's kind of the asyncio equivalent of um, forking off a thread. So it says, here's some task, I want you to just go and do it in the background and keep executing normally, and then you can have multiple of these coroutines happening in parallel. Um, the problem is memory. So this might be what you start seeing, sort of each different pattern there might correspond to access to a different piece of memory, but you can see now if you do this, you know, all three of them are touching the sort of polka dot memory at the same time. Uh, so what you can do is just have s allocate memory separately for each of these things as you get to them, but you can start quickly using up the memory on your GPU. And so I've avoided this. Also memory allocation can be quite expensive on a GPU, so ideally you want to allocate the memory you need up front and then just keep reusing it. Uh, so what you actually want to do is serialize this so that uh, the things that use the same memory are serialized, but you still get some parallelism. And, any, and that actually applies to any kind of resource, not just memory. It might be um, you might want to serialize access to the network cards so that you don't start mixing together packets from two different frames, that kind of thing. Okay, so how are we going to fix this? Well, serializing access to a resource, that's locking, right? <laughs> so async code does have a lock class, but it doesn't quite solve all the problems we have, so I've done something a little different. So one of the problems you can have is things can actually end up out of order where actually it starts processing the third Hello. Okay. So you can see here it started processing the third frame before it's actually uh, worked on the second frame, and you can get weird effects there. Where? Oh, do you want to? Are you good with that? I'll use this for now. Right. And then suddenly, you whatever's downstream of you starts getting these things back out of order, and it has to reorder them, and that just gets nasty. Um, the other thing is there's some extra stuff I'm going to hopefully get time to get to later, uh, which doesn't fit in so well with this locking idea. So we're going to use futures. Who's heard of futures? Uh, about half of you, I guess. So a future is just a, a result that you don't know yet, which something is going to fill in the result later. And if you have a future, you can say, uh, I want the result, please, and it will wait until the result is available from something else. Five minutes, ouch. 
Okay, I um, guess I'm not going to be getting to my backup material. So the uh, future is just a place that's going to hold something. So what I've done is I have a resource, and I have a future for each use of the resource. So there's this future here which isn't actually going to hold anything. Um, then the first thing that wants to use this resource allocates it. I've called that allocation zero. And when it's done, it's going to set a result in future one. It's actually going to set a result of none because we don't need a value. We're just using this for the timing properties. Then the next thing that wants to use the resource gets allocation number one. It's going to wait for future one, which means it's effectively waiting for the previous user. And when it's done, it's going to set a result in future two. And if we want to make another allocation, we do that. So it's then going to wait for the next version of the future. And it's going to update the, res the resource always points at the most recent thing you have to wait for. So turning into code, you've got a class. I think I'm going to skip over this because I've been told I have five minutes left. And I'm about halfway through my slides. Um, and that's the actual allocation. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to skip over all this <coughs> code just to get to some other things because there's quite a lot of code here. Um, so the good news is now we've got this whole thing non-blocking and we've fixed our race conditions. And that means you can integrate it with some sort of network service which will remain responsive and you still only do almost everything on one thread. Uh, you can overlap your work now. You've got safe access. There's still some things we'd like to improve. So it's still doing a lot of synchronization via the CPU because um, you've yeah, and the other problem is there's nothing actually limiting how many tasks might be running in parallel. So if you're taking more than half a second to process one of these things, it's going to happily accept them off the network and just start creating more and more of these tasks. And you're going to fall behind, you're going to use more and more memory, and eventually you're going to crash. Whereas what you actually want to do is just not accept more work from the network if you're too overloaded. Um, I think I'm actually going to skip this whole section and go off to the miscellaneous advice. Uh, OK, so miscellaneous things, things I've learned the hard way. So all this code I've shown works with Python 3.4 or 3.5. Uh, there's a backport to this module called Trollius. It's sort of deprecated, so there's going to be no new features. But if you're stuck on Python 2, which we are, because we have a big legacy code base, uh, it works. Um, you can't use the Python 3.4 syntax, uh, the yield from syntax, but Trollius has just got some workarounds. So you use from with capital F, and it's a function instead of a keyword. Uh, you can't return from a generator in Python 2, so you have to raise an exception, which is a wraps your return. On the other hand, if you're very forward-looking and writing new code and you're excited about Python 3.5, it's got some syntactic sugar to do all this, and it... Um, checks your errors, you know, catches a few things at, at syntax checking time rather than at runtime. Uh, it also has asynchronous iterables, so you can say async for i in this thing. Uh, I haven't actually found a use for it, but I haven't used Python 3.5 at all. So as I say, it checks your errors a bit more. Uh, exception handling. So one of the issues you find with this async function, which launches your task off to one side, is what happens if it throws an exception? Um, oops, I think I've gone two slides. So uh, in Python 3, at least, uh, you'll get a stack trace, but it tells you warning task exception was never retrieved. If you use it with Python 2 and Trollius, it's even worse. You get your exception, but you don't know where it came from. And if you get value error divided by zero, well, good luck. You're never going to find it. So one of the options is you should rejoin with your tasks. This is the equivalent of a thread join, in, uh, if you're using threading, is when you say yield from a future, that will, and if the future came from one of these asynchronous tasks, any exception that was raised in that task will come out in the task that's joining it in the yield from. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can just log it. Uh, this is what I've mostly done, which is because we'll have a task which is like start capturing data from the telescope, and then eight hours later you'll say you'll get another command which says stop capturing data from the telescope, and it will then join in, and you'll see that oh there was an exception eight hours ago. Uh, that's a bit late. You want to log it as soon as it happens. So you can see it when you 
sort of keep track of your logs. Uh, the other cool thing is for shutdown, you can actually cancel tasks, even ones that are in progress. It will essentially throw an exception at the next yield point. This is a bit different from concurrent futures where you can cancel them, but it doesn't actually do anything unless they haven't started yet. If they're still sitting in the queue, you can cancel them, but if they're running, there's nothing you can do. They're just going to keep running. How am I doing on time, David? Uh, getting towards wrapping up. Okay. I'm, okay. Uh, right. So I'll briefly mention Tornado. Uh, how many people use Tornado? Okay, some of you. Um, I don't. I know less about Twisted, which I think a lot of people use as well. Is you can mix async I/O and Tornado in the same program. In fact, I've done this because our control protocol, which uh, Nilan, my colleague, has done a lot of work on, using Tornado for that. Uh, you just have to make sure that you use Tornado to run the event loop and use a special Tornado async I/O main loop, but it's very easy to do. You can also even do tighter integration where you mix futures between the two. So you can turn a async I/O future into a tornado future and vice versa, which I've had to do in a few places as well. There's one catch which got me a bit, which is here's an example of a main program which just runs some asynchronous function until it's complete. And they look very similar, except for those round brackets there. If you mess that up, strange things happen. It doesn't run your function, or it runs it immediately instead of on the loop for something wrong. And I think that's all I have. So thank you for your attention. Uh, sorry, I ran late. Thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting. And we do actually have some time for questions. If you want to ask some questions, technically it's coffee now, but things are a little bit behind schedule. Um, we are 15, officially 15 minutes late. Um, the, the schedule on the website is correct. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Give that man a bell, uh, 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 <laughs> microphone. If I have an NVIDIA card, how do I play with this? Okay, so there's two languages you can use. There's OpenCL and uh, CUDA. Um, CUDA is sort of NVIDIA's proprietary thing, so you'd be locked into it, but it's normally a bit easier to use. And there are Python wrappers, PyCUDA and PyOpenCL, um, which you can, f I assume, find documentation about on the web. Uh, there's also Number Pro, which I think is commercial, has support for sort of magically doing stuff on the GPU where you write Python code and put a decorate on and it sort of examines your Python syntax and creates GPU code out of it. I've never actually tried using that, so I don't know any details. I think it's on. Okay, awesome. Um, so you, you mentioned that you're kind of building this into a framework rather than just solving like some specific problem. Is that going to be open source and um, sort of abstracted so that we can all use it, or? Uh, right, so open sourcing. So it's a bit tricky because we work for uh, government departments. On the one hand, yes, the goal is to open source everything. On the other hand, being the government means we deal with bureaucracy. And we can't just open source anything until we've gone through a whole process, which I think Eventually, the minister has to sort of agree to it. I don't know if it's quite that hairy, but um, it can be done. Yeah, Nilan has got stuff open sourced, um, but yeah, it's it's a bit of work. So, but at kind least of technically, it's reusable, right? Yeah, it should be. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much.